How do you really believe in yourself after being told that you'll never be anything? How do you overcome being abandoned by your parents, going through the system, and constantly being let down again and again? How do you rise up from poverty, injustice, pain, suffering, and hurt, and ultimately use that suffering to do something great? Well, in today's episode, I talk with my great friend, Eric Carnesis, who is the author of a brand new book called Golden Scissors. And Eric's journey is just that. When he was young, he found both of his pr- parents in prison. He himself, along with his brother, were homeless, living in fields and abandoned houses. He went through the foster care system, experiencing some of the most brutal and horrific torture, for lack of a better term, that any child could go through. Had his own bouts with the law in and out of trouble many times over. It's actually kind of like I'm reading my own story here. And today has found himself in a position where he is leading a life full of love, gratitude, honor, hope, and most importantly, one of self-actualization. When I interviewed Eric, I couldn't help but sit across from him and feel this kindred brotherhood. You know as well as I do that there are certain people that you share a common link with that forever bonds you. And sometimes, unfortunately, that link is pain, it's suffering, it's hurt. And it's also rising from those ashes to become the phoenix that you're capable of being. And that is to say, in today's episode, Eric is going to share not only the depths and darkness of his human experience, but what it looks like to truly transform trauma to triumph, to take those breakdowns and turn them to breakthroughs, and to be unbroken. I highly suggest that you take a look at his brand new book called Golden Scissors. It's available wherever you get books. And deep dive into this man's journey, his mindset, and his ability to have overcome some of the worst traumatic experiences any child could have to live a life of gratitude and purpose. If you guys go to Amazon or to thinkunbrokenpodcast.com or to wherever you get books, you can grab your copy of Golden Scissors today. I endorse this book. You know, on this show, I never talk about anything that I don't care deeply about or have been impacted by. And this conversation with Eric, as well as his new book, is something that is going to sit with me for years to come. With that said, my friends, thank you for listening. Please make sure you subscribe and share this episode because when you do, you're helping other people on their journey. And without further ado, Let's get into the show. Eric Carnesis, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for asking. You know, I was mentioning before we started recording, but I wanted to make sure I get it on on tape how much I admire your work and enjoy your podcast. And I'm honored to be here and just thank you very much. You have all my gratitude. So let's go. Mm. Reciprocated, man. Appreciate you. Thank you for that. You know, one of the things that is really interesting about getting to do this show is that I get to spend a lot of time diving into the minds of people who sit across from me. And sometimes that journey is really fun. And sometimes that journey is a little bit dark. And it's a little bit dark because it puts me in this place of recognizing and appreciating the suffering that certain individuals have that leads them to this moment. And while I have gratitude for that and I get to sit across from someone like you, it's just my heart goes out to that, that child version of you and the journey that they had to go through because, you know, like sees like, soul sees soul. If you were to describe childhood in one word, what would it be? One word. Um, I, that's a really good question. Scared. Mm. What does that mean? I think, I think I've been battling sort of a darkness my whole life. And when I was younger, I had less understanding of what that darkness was and how I was going to overcome it. And, you know, through different things in my life from, 
from small things like being bullied in elementary school to bigger things like houses burning down or creepy babysitters, right? So there's just like things in my life where I've battled boogeymen and all these things where at a young age, um, I was afraid, plain and simple. And so I remember being afraid and, um, you know, now not cowering. Mm -hmm. I was never cowering. Even when the bullies were bullying me, I remember confronting them. I've been in plenty of fights before my parents went to prison and after when I was on the streets, you know, that's just how life was growing up. But being scared was a strong enough part of my childhood where when you asked me that question off guard, that's the word that popped in my head. Yeah, I get it. Been there. You know, that's one of the things that people don't really truly understand about the chaos of childhood for a lot of people is that when you're young, in some sense, it's like the norm and you're sitting in this experience and you're looking at it and you're like, well, I guess life is just chaotic all the time. And I, I know a little bit more about your background and this, this thing that we share in common, which is incredibly unfortunate is like being homeless as kids, sleeping in places that you don't know if you're safe, like living a life where you have to do what it takes to survive. I know at a very young age, your parents ended up going to prison. What was that like? That was a, a very sad time for me. Um, I was, I remember younger before that happened, excuse me, when I went to camp for the first time and I really just was homesick and I wanted to go home. And that whole week I was like miserable at camp. I was there doing the things, but I was miserable. And then when I finally got picked up to go home, I remember being so happy. And then you fast forward to my parents going to prison and I'm catapulted out into this cold world. And all I wanted was to go home, sort of like that experience I had at camp, only there was no home to go back to. And that hollowness um, and that homesickness sort of followed me for 20 years, probably. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I use the word homesickness because I attribute it to that feeling I had at camp. But what it really was was just depression. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I remember being young and, and people would ask me, like, do you miss being at home? Because I would be at strangers house between eight to 12. We lived with probably like 30 different families. Like I was over here. My brother was over here. My sister was over here. We were, we hardly ever saw each other. If we did, it was like at my grandma's house or she would take one of us for the weekend. It was always just so chaotic. I never had a home. And then people would ask me like, do you miss home? And I was like, I can't miss something I've never really had, you know? And I, I think that that's a big part of the conversation that led me down this path of being nomadic and traveling and trying to find myself in the world. But when you're young, like you don't know any different, you don't know better. Growing up and, and having, having to be in these places about unknownness, about, you know, fear and being scared. What was it like to navigate that as a kid? Cause I think like people would look at you now and they'd go, man, Eric, he's like, Figured out this business, millions of dollars, cool cars, big house, an awesome Harley motorcycle. And then you go, man, this guy has really figured out life. But I think people fail to remember it. Like we all start as children. How did you like, what were the mechanisms for coping? What was the experience in childhood for just navigating the world? That's a good question. Um, so first of all, your childhood sounds horrible. Um, bouncing from house to house and i uh, couldn't even imagine what that was like i was grateful enough or lucky enough to have at least a solid sort of single mother household but solid enough for you know the first portion of my childhood to where i had this stability feeling something to miss and mm. i couldn't even imagine what you must have gone through um can you repeat the question because yeah. i was so busy thinking about you i forgot yeah the yeah question, so. <laughs> <laughs> no worries um, I'm just trying to understand like how you navigate all of that unknown, all of that fear, like, like how does a child like, yeah, be able to walk the earth in those circumstances? Yeah, there was a transition. Um, it, it, it took a, there's many different levels of how I navigated and it took time and it started off just being really sad and, you know, listening to a, a repeating song on a Walkman that made me think of my parents and looking up at the moon and crying and thinking that my parents were looking at the moon at the same time I was. And there was like this real sad 
uh, almost broken version of myself that moped around the streets, staring at my feet and was afraid to look up at the world and, and just felt really victimized by, by the world. And then obviously you start getting really cold at night and you, and you can't cry yourself into yourself into warmth and you're starting to get really hungry and you can't cry food into your stomach. And so you start learning, okay, well, I have to make things happen. I have to do something with my life. And so then the crying almost turns into anger and frustration. And so now I'm navigating life super angry and mm. super frustrated. And I'm literally triggered at everything because when you're young, you're supposed to be taken care of. So it's easy to blame other people. So I navigated very triggered and I would steal from any store. I didn't think about it as a small business. I never thought even like the idea of a business owner and profits and return on investment. None of that was in my mind. As far as I knew, all the stores were owned by the same government that ruined my life. Mm. And so I was just stealing food, uh, just blindly uh, victimizing people in my wake. Right. Didn't even understand what I was doing, but I was, you know, 12 years old. I don't have this concept. My brain's not fully developed yet. So, uh, you know, then the anger um, is where you find your strength it, mm. or where I found my strength. And so the anger lasted longer than almost all the rest. The mm. depression outlasted all of it. But, um, but the anger was really that what I thought that, you know, that fire inside you that just gets you through it and pushes you to the next journey and the next one. And you're fearless and you're invincible and you've got that. I attributed that fire to anger and aggression. Now, circling forward 20 years, I realized that that was actually love and peace that was giving me that fire. But I thought it was anger and aggression. Mm. And so I navigated in that manner and I was very selfish in a way uh, because i had to be mm -hmm. that's how you take care of yourself if i was hungry i had to go get food if i was cold i needed to find warmth if i had to break a window to get into a garage to sleep that's what i had to do to get warm and it was about me 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 not who had to fix the broken window and who had to recoup their losses on on profitability at their store so if that kind of sums up what my seventh yeah. and eighth grade was like yeah but you don't know what you don't know right yeah. and and i look back at those moments of breaking into houses, stealing cars, running from the cops, getting shot at, mm -hmm. stealing food, selling drugs, hundreds of fights, just had to do what I had to do. Now, some of this is like nature versus nurture. You know, I, I heard you say that your father was Tupac, you know, growing up and being a kid. And for me, it was Jay-Z. And I would sit here and I would like consume ad nauseum these men's the, the content. And I, I didn't realize like the role that it would actually play in my life. Because when you're hearing songs like Girls, Girls, Girls and Money Over and these, and you're like, okay, cool. That sets you up with this foundation of chasing. And when I was young, I always felt like if I can go and get rich, right, then I will have a, a better life. Solving for lack of parents, lack of stability, lack of love, lack of nourishing, lack of nurturing. And when I was young, it just seemed to make sense. When you look back at that and this experience of like, man, I, I'm finding fatherhood in this music. What did that, did that set you up for failure? Did it like give you certain things? Like what was that like for you? Yeah, I think so. Understanding that no human being is perfect and my father especially, um, isn't perfect and I love him for it. And, um, you know, him being a repeat criminal, he was in prison my whole life, always selling drugs. He's um, very uh, sort of in that lifestyle. He raised me with prison rules about snitching and minding my own business. And I mean, he, whenever he was out of prison, he treated me like I was in prison with him. And so you have to, it's it. I don't think that having rap music as my idols was necessarily a bad thing. Um, I was very confused as a kid. I think, I think a young boy needs a man to help him figure out his thoughts as he's coming into manhood. We have, you know, women get a lot of talk about all these um, hormones and things because they have their monthly cycles and they sort of up and down. But men also are full of hormones mm -hmm. and we also have cycles and we're up and down. 
And so understanding that as a kid, we're going through, we're feeling things for the first time, we're getting chemicals in our brain that we don't know how to control, testosterone is making us angry, and we have all this stuff happening, and a father would be really helpful at teaching us what all that feeling means and understanding that our strength is for healing, not hurting. But I'd sometimes just want to punch things. And so, which is the opposite of what our strength is for as men. And someone like Tupac was helpful because he was talking to me and the way he rapped and the things he talked about were things I felt. I felt like I needed to uh, keep my head up. I feel like I needed to protect my essence and and remember because my mom always told me I was beautiful. She told me I was smart. She told me I could have anything I wanted. And the foster system was the exact opposite of that. And the streets were the opposite of that. And so then I'm like, okay, how can I maintain like my mom says I'm so special, but the whole world says I'm a piece of shit. So what is it? Mm-hmm. And then someone like Tupac comes along and he's true to himself. He doesn't, in a way, I mean, he does have radio edits, but like he doesn't censor himself. He was very controversial and he stood for what he believed in. And I think that he was a really amazing role model for that side of things. Mm -hmm. Now, there's also the gangster side and I'm from a neighborhood and we did set trip. We were gangsters and, you know, banging little uh, gang bangers stuff like blue rags, claiming folk, stuff like that. I mean, just stuff from the 80s. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, you know, one of our foster homes was, uh, OG Poppy, who was like, was a founder of the Crips in Compton and sort of got in trouble, went to prison and hid out on the East coast to sort of retire from that life. But he brought us in with that same conversation and those same rules as well. And so we had like all of this stuff around us where the rap music wasn't the worst part. The streets were the worst part Mm -hmm. and finding strength in that music really helped me. And if you are confused about how to be a man, if, and you have a man who can help talk to you, then I think that it, it's powerful any way you take it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I was tremendously confused as how to be a man, Yeah, you know, and I look back now at this healing journey and so much of the beginning of it was, I was around the wrong guys, you know, no father never met him abusive stepdad i'm in the streets like my my best friend's brother as a kid when he got out of prison we were like oh this is the greatest thing to ever happen because like he was like 19 when we're 12 you know and he was the measure right even though he had gone to prison and he had been locked up for a couple of years like we were like oh yeah he's out this is awesome the very first night this dude gets out we end up going and still in a car getting high and then God knows what else happened. Cause we were like, so ripped. I don't even really remember more 12. I'm like, but this is like what it's supposed to be. And then it kind of transformed into suddenly that becomes the new normal. And it was drugs and theft and running the streets and getting kicked out of high school. Like, it's so funny. I, sh- I shared with someone the other day, this, this luckily that I have it, this picture of my report card, my freshman year of high school with a point six GPA point six. And, and to me, I was like, what do I need education for? Cause these streets are teaching me everything I need to know, which I think is one of the biggest lies ever. And, and I was wondering, you know, you said that the streets and the foster care system taught you the opposite. And so I'm wondering like, what did it teach you? Cause I don't think this conversation's had enough and I don't think people really understand what it's like. Yeah, um, it taught me two things. It, it it taught me in a way the world and mm. do your own thing, and which is one of my biggest strengths today is that I do my own thing. But it it taught me that I was worthless. It taught me that I didn't deserve anything. That I was definitely a second class citizen, and um, it taught me that the world was cold. And that I was alone. Really, it was really uh, a lonely, heartbreaking, lost experience. No one in the foster system cared. At least in in the ghettos of Virginia, the foster system is a, it's the same. You know, in the eighties and nineties, I'm not I'm not in touch with those neighborhoods anymore. 
um, I've evolved out of them. And but when I was in them, it was really big to have as many kids as you could have. We'd have we'd have a woman in a one bedroom apartment with five kids mm -hmm. because of the welfare checks and the the baby daddy would be outside polishing the rims on his Lexus. And it was like, it's clear that they're having a bunch of kids to get all this welfare money to put rims on their cars and put custom stereos in their cars. And they're living in these tenements instead of using the money to take care of themselves. And it's the same with the foster system. The foster system is just how many kids can I get in my house? How many paychecks can I get? And then how small can I spend on these little so that I can take care of myself? And so, you know, we weren't allowed to drink the milk in the fridge in one house. Like we were drinking water and eating grapefruits and that was it. Mm. And so we were starving to death in that house and they'd wake us up with spray bottles. Like we were feral cats and just like the weirdest thing. When I say us, I'm talking about my twin brother and I. And so, um, you know, and then we've, we've just had a long journey of really hateful, hateful foster care. Uh, we had the predator molester and we had, uh, the starvation. Another person made us commit crimes to pay rent, would give us a shopping list to go to Walmart and steal the shopping list. And then uh, if ever we were like bothering that foster parent, she would scream at us and yell at us and call us thieves and ghetto hoodlums because we would steal. But we were stealing because she was making mm -hmm. us to pay her. She was very bipolar. It was, as an adult looking back, that particular woman actually just had some mental problems and she really shouldn't have been a foster parent. Uh, she was definitely bipolar and all over the place, but we were going through these experiences and we're being treated like nothing. And all we have is just a memory of once being something trying to hang on to that. And the more, and that's another problem is the more we were trying to hang on to the past, it was making the present moment even harder. Mm. And that's when we decided to run away to after sort of all that and end up just homeless. Yeah. There, I hear that and I go, yeah, no wonder you hate the world. You know, and I, I feel that. And I, I was never in foster care, but I was around foster homes quite frequently. And we saw some of the horrendous things that can happen to kids. There, are, And look, I'll, I'll say this for context. I'm not going to talk about it here. And there, are, I've said over the years, there are certain things I will never bring to the light of day. And some of those things I witnessed in foster care homes and that, that stuff I've reserved for therapy, for journaling, for coaching, for my own healing, because it was so dark. I just don't think it helps anybody. And so my, my heart goes out to everyone who's ever experienced that because it's when you are in the wrong homes, which obviously yeah. sounds like you got frequency of, there's no doubt that children are looked at as checks. And I, I saw that vividly in firsthand. Um, I guess you could call it secondhand. I never lived in the homes, but I was in them enough. You know, I was never in the system, but my, my stepfather's mother was a foster care parent. And I have said this publicly, she's arguably one of the worst human beings I've ever known. But then I think to myself, God, how bad was her life? Right? Because this is hurt people, hurt people, you know, at the end of the day, but you, you did something really interesting at such a young age and you chose homelessness. You chose to leave. You chose to get away. For me, it wasn't a choice. At eight years old, getting bounced around like that, I had no idea. I thought it was just like my life. I thought it was normal to sleep and spend the night in a van. But you chose it because you realized that you wanted something more. But here you are now in this position where I would have to imagine there's like this really interesting juxtaposition and internal argument that you're having where on one hand, it's like you could be warm tonight and suffer or you could be cold tonight and be free. How did you guys get to that point? The, it took, it took some months of, of really suffering and just understanding that it was never going to get better because we went from one foster house to the other, to the other, to the other. And it was just always a nightmare. And it, it was the most exciting that we felt was when we were out walking by ourselves out of the foster homes. And it was also not something that we planned. It mm. was, we were at our last foster house. It was really, it was really terrible. And we had just gone through so much and the emotional uh, side, I think was the worst part 
you know, like, okay, you can starve me. You can, op- you can wake me up with, with spray bottles and you can try to molest me. All the weird sh- that people do, like you're all predators and you all, and f- you all, that was my mindset back then. And none of that really matters to me as much as what mattered was how good I felt when I was outside in the sunshine with my brother doing our things. So we're in this house and it's like the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. Like, you know, it, I can't, it was so insignificant. I don't remember the trigger. I just remember that I came into the foster home after being outside and immediately was just confronted and yelled at and belittled and it was condescending talk and it was just i could feel like hatred and anger bubbling up tears were coming out of my eyes i wasn't like uh weeping and i wasn't red-faced or anything but i was just getting this like emotional uproar and i remember that just the like a knee-jerk reaction the only thing i could do was just turn and run And so I just turned and I just ran out the door and Anthony ran out beside me and the two of us just ran as fast as we could, as far as we could for as long as we could and, um, just never looked back. And we ran, you know, CPS obviously comes after you. They kidnap children all the time and there's all kinds of stuff I'd like to talk about for that on another, um, time. But, um, they came for us for about six months. They'd come skidding around the corner like DEA agents and try to, box us in and we would hop fences and get away. And after about six months, they just stopped coming. They just gave up. And that's at that moment, we were finally wards of the court. We were finally free. And, um, and it wasn't easy. We were, I mean, you know, freezing cold at night and Mm. shivering and wet in the rain and having to break into garages to escape it and eating candy bars and raw hot dogs. I mean, it was, it was rough, but yeah, we chose it for sure. Mm-hmm. It was better than foster care. Yeah. I mean, that's the same thought I have about living with my grandmother. I mean, she took, she had taken one of my little brothers. I had been living in an abandoned house by myself for about six weeks in the blistering hot summer of Indiana, stealing food from the big lots on the corner of 30th and Georgetown, mainly candy. Cause I was like yeah. 11 and I didn't <laughs> know. And, and I was one night. She comes by the house and she's like, where's your mom? And I say, I haven't seen my mom in weeks. I'm literally, there's no water. There's no electricity. The house smells disgusting. It's scorching hot. And she's like, all right, you're coming with me. Cause she already had one of my little brothers. And so I go stay with her and I really, really didn't want to be there. My I'm biracial, black and white. My grandma's an old racist white lady from a town in Tennessee. You never heard of. So imagine the the person who's supposed to love you and help you calling you all these horrible racial epitaphs with a copy of Mein Kampf, Hitler's autobiography on the kitchen table. My uncle's in the Aryan Brotherhood, like the whole thing. She'd give me white boy haircuts with like the chili bowl, you know, imagine this hair getting those <laughs> haircuts and you're like, okay, wait a second. Well, this is better. This is the alternative to being on the street. Right. And sometimes it is that. And like, while it was reversed for us, it was still kind of the same thing. This suffering is better than that suffering. And, you know, my mom would disappear for weeks at a time. No one knew where she was. My stepdad had taken my, my baby brother and he was like an over the road trucker, never talked to that guy. And, and I remember people would ask me like, are you talking to your mom? Where is, where is she? What's going on? Where's your stepdad? Like, I have no idea. And so I was like really just in the streets, just doing whatever it took to survive. And so I'm curious, were you in communication with your parents at all? Like, did they know what was happening? Well, we weren't, we weren't, but I would, I do want to say, um, you're making me feel almost blessed to have this foster system. That was a nightmare because for you to have war within your own family, like your own grandma, I couldn't imagine what that must've been like for you and what you must've been going through. Um, I'm sure emotionally we dealt with a lot of similarities, but, Mm -hmm. but that's, that's, um, I mean, wow. You know, I've always been able to have this idea of like my perfect mom and dad, and if they weren't in prison, how they'd be for me. And, um, and my grandfather was pretty amazing for me. And so I just, my heart goes out to the young you that, you know, that I'm sure that you're hugging right now and you've healed, but my heart goes out to them. And, um, you know, that's crazy, but 
as far as my parents go, um, I was in touch with my dad never, um, but he was shipped off to prison a few months before the DEA raided our house and I lost my mom. So he was, he, he got locked up in August and he would call the house once a week. We would chat before my mom got locked up. He'd call the house once a week and we would chat. Then he was sort of off. And then they came in and raided the house and took my mom. And at that point we didn't talk to our dad again for many, many years. My mom, for the first few weeks, we would go visit her. My grandfather would come and take us to go visit her. We were squatting in the house, uh, sort of similar to you. Um, and my grandfather would come by and check on us. He'd bring us like old expired food and stuff like that. That was his thing. He shopped at flea markets and stuff. He showed up one night, with a garbage bag full of expired, um, like crackers or something. And so we would like, you know, squat there and do our thing. And we, we had our grandfather, so we were happy and he'd take us to visit our mom. So we were in touch the first six weeks, but then he died. He came over and died in the front yard. And that's like a whole other tragic story. Like just how much more can you lose as a kid? You know, we, we have this one guy we're hanging on to and he passes away in the front yard, right in front of us. And it was, um, one of the, one of the worst experiences of my life was losing him. But, but at that point we lost contact with our mother as well. And so from then on, it was just a memory, looking at the moon, remembering things she'd say, listening to a song and, you know, sort of hanging on to it. And then, you know, that living in the past and that's how you get these codependencies and this depression and this anxiety and all the, all the things that you battle as a young adult are all coming from like not letting go of the past and hanging on to something. And, you know, mm -hmm. we were just set up for, for this anxiety from the start. And it was, you know, looking back, it's, I wish I was me then. It would have been so easy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, if I was me then, I'd be a freaking billionaire right yeah, now. Yeah, super easy. Right? But, it, but it's not. And, you know, I, I, I think about this a lot. I, I used to be in conflict with people who would say what I'm about to say. And then I realized there must be truth to it. And that is that we choose this journey as spiritual beings. And that we choose this journey as spiritual beings because when we do... It allots us the, the ability to use our gift to help other people. But, and, and we'll get to that in a moment. But one of the things that I, I think about is you're in this moment of childhood and it feels like the world is against you. How do you find the courage to just keep going? Right. For me, it felt like, well, what else am I going to do? I don't, there is no other option than just to go forward. But there was something in me, Eric, and, and it's hard to explain. And I don't want it to come off the wrong way, but I knew I was going to be amazing. Like, I just knew I was going to be great. I knew I was going to have fortune and fame and success and all those things. And I had them and I lost them. And then I had them again and then I lost them and then I had them again. Right. But it was like, as a kid, I was like, I know, I know there's something different. There was one time I went to this, this guy's house, right? Cause we never knew where we were going to land. I know. Idea. Every night was different. If we got three nights in the same house, it was like a godsend. And I end up at this guy's house. And this dude is, from my recollection of being like 10 years old at the time, this dude was loaded. And he had a BMW in the garage. And he had actually had three cars in the garage. And he had a garage. And, <laughs> and he had bedrooms. And he had heat. And he had water. And he had electricity. And he had a refrigerator full of food. And he was like the nicest dude ever. And it was just me. I don't even know where my little brothers were. This is how bad it was. And it was just me. And he was super cool. Not a, not a single negative thing happened in that experience. But I remember being like sitting in his living room and he had a big screen TV. Now this is the nineties. And so this thing had to weigh like a thousand pounds and you know, it's that giant gray box. And we were watching TV. And I just remember being like, I'm going to have this one day. Like that was, that was seated also within the thought of a couple of years earlier being like, when I'm an adult, my life will be different. And so I just kept thinking about it constantly, man, people thought I was selling drugs and because I was a bad kid. I was just trying to get out. That was it. Like I wasn't, and that's true for a lot of people. Why are we still, we're trying to get out. Nobody told us there was another option. And so I just kept thinking as a kid, one day, one day, one day, one day. And I, I positioned that. Obviously, it's come to pass in many ways, but it was my daydreaming 
it was me being like, and I would have teachers be like, you're, you're a loser. I literally had teachers be like, you're a loser. You're never going to do anything. Cause all you do is dream. And I was like, but look at me now. And so I'm wondering, like, how did you just keep going? Was it something like that, that you were holding on to? Was it this idea of a better life that would put you through? Cause like me, I mean, you didn't graduate high school. You were in tons of fights. You were set up for failure. You were a homeless kid. You like our stories could not be more similar. How in the world did you persevere? Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to that. Um, I persevered in two ways sort of simultaneously and, you know, I'm maybe this is how it's done or maybe because I'm a Gemini, there's two different sides, but I will say on the positive side, the, there was three years that my dad got out of prison before he went back to prison. There was like this three year window and he became this nationwide, amazing drug dealer. He bought a mansion and filled it with all these things. And in that three year period, so he, he was a good entrepreneur. He was a good entrepreneur. Okay. Yeah. You know? <laughs> But, um, he would, he would pick us up and he would have like rob reports and DuPont registries around. And so I would flip through the DuPont registry and I'd look at what is that? a DuPont registry is like where you can buy expensive cars that are used, used expensive okay. cars. Yeah. So like, if you want a, a Lamborghini Diablo from the nineties or something, you could go to the DuPont registry and find one for $900,000 or something. And you know, it's just, oh, not bad. Yeah. <laughs> so it's no, no, no big deal. Um, and then the Rob report is like, uh, where you, it's like a catalog for shopping for the rich and famous, you know, where you can, you can look at what yacht you want to buy, which air, uh, airplane you want, if you want a golf stream or whatever. And so it's like this, you know, nice watches. I don't even think they have Rolexes in the Rob report. It's like nice things. It's like APs. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, he would have these magazines and we, me and Anthony would flip through them and we would talk about, oh, I'm going to have this car. And I mean, we were just, you know, doing do what things. kids do. Yeah. And so, um, you know, then you fast forward to homelessness and, you know, I remember you don't choose the things you're going to remember, you know, as you're going through life, you're not like, this mm. is going to be. And, you know, they say that the things that you really do remember are the things of, uh, that your higher self is looking back on. And then you're remembering it because of your higher self was watching you through that. Mm. And they say, you know, and so anyway, in this moment, me and Anthony are face drunk. We're, you know, we're in seventh grade. We were stealing alcohol instead of food. We transitioned from candy bars to forties. And so reasonable now we're stomping around. We're face drunk. We had walked around all night long. It's like three o'clock in the morning and we're in a grass field and we we're like, this is as good a place as any. And so we lay down and we just lay back to back and we start falling asleep in this grass field. And I remember that night in particular, because I was thinking about how soft the grass was and how comfortable it was on my face. And I was daydreaming about which Lamborghini I was going to own. And I like felt myself driving around in this Lamborghini and I, and I felt this like wealth in this energy of abundance. And it was like just this, but it was just me daydreaming and trying to escape my reality. You know, I just wanted to go someplace else. And so I just was going someplace else and I was rocking myself to sleep essentially. And, you know, now that I know how the universe works, um, I was obviously vision boarding and manifesting a future for myself that, you know, unexpectedly was doing that, just trying to escape. It was more like escapism, but it was manifestation. So that's one way. Uh, the other way I got out of it was I really owned it. I really was like, I was like, okay, if I'm a piece of, I'm a piece of, shit. and so I was the tough guy and I was the gangster and I was unbreakable and you couldn't shake me emotionally. I put walls up and it's funny that you talk about drug dealing because, you know, I sold drugs from middle school through college. That's how I paid for my whole life till I got my first job and never once did I ever consider myself a drug dealer. And I knew drug dealers and I was like, oh, that's a drug dealer. That's a drug dealer. Um, like there were some people that were just grimy and, and street and they were drug dealers. Mm. And that was never me, even though I was doing, you know, even in high school, we did quarter million dollar drug deals, ecstasy. And I, we had people come over and put a brick of cocaine on the table and we'd all sit there with our driver's licenses and like sniff cocaine off my glass table and count out ecstasy pills and empty backpacks full of hundred dollar bills. And we were doing these things that drug dealers do, but never identified as a drug dealer. Like if you asked me what I was, I'd be like, oh, I'm a student. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
It was um, so self identity. I think young is entrepreneur com- yeah. society, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But it's, it's definitely self-identity is important. So by vision boarding my future and by identifying as something other than what I was, you know, at the time, I mm. think helped. You know, I, I remember the first time I got caught at school selling drugs. Um, I had been pretty successful at it. And it was a moment where I let someone else do something that got me in trouble. And so luckily call it fate, call it God, call it luck. I have no idea. I didn't get caught with anything on me. So instead of going to jail, I just got expelled and which is weird. And then they had to let me back into school because they couldn't prove it, which is this whole other thing we won't get into right now. But I remember distinctly having a similar thought where it's like, I'm not a drug dealer. I'm just trying to survive. That's it. This is all I want. And, and there's something to that that has also driven me this moment i would daydream as a kid about being a rock star like that's all i ever wanted is like fame and fortune and girls and cool cars and cool clothes and tattoos and all that stuff and then it's like be careful what you wish for right because what i've come to realize now i mean we're 30 years removed from those daydreams is like i get to be of service and i get to help and i get to create change in the world and i have amazing health, wealth, and relationships. And, and so much of that has come through healing because when I, and you know this, and I know your background, having failed multiple businesses, like another thing we have in common is like borrowing money from people in our lives to pay our rent, not having enough, having like my girlfriend who I lived with would give me a check so we could pay our freaking rent. We lived together. And, and like the reason I'm bringing this up is because, you know, we have this really misaligned understanding of manhood and childhood. And it's not what I think being a man is. I think it's really a victimhood mode and a survival mode. And then you become an adult and you're like, well, what does it mean to be a man? Well, I had Tupac, I had Jay-Z, I had the streets, I had all these things. And then I don't think it really starts to transpire as you figuring out, because you said you got to know who you are. Like, I don't think that happens until you get hit in the face with a baseball bat. And so I'm, I'm wondering, like, where did the transition start for you from, all right, here I am, this student entrepreneur, drug dealer, into actually, I've got to go a different path. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. Um, I got the message before I listened to it, for sure. Uh, my senior year in high school, I made it all the way to senior year somehow. Mm. because my clientele was in the classroom. Sure. Right. So obviously I'm going to go to school every day because that's how I sell the most of my stuff. And, um, and so I end up my senior year going to jail for armed robbery. And, and so now, and I've been drunk and on drugs since middle school and the drugs only got worse through high school, obviously. And, you know, it's, um, the acid and the ecstasy and the cocaine and the cigarettes and, just everything Mm -hmm. and then always alcohol and always opiates i mean i've been uh i was an opiate addict for like 25 years i went i guess addict's the wrong word but i mean i was an avid opiate user i chased the dragon for like 25 years but i think that was the first time in my life when i was sitting in a jail cell that i was that i got sober it was the first time i was seeing things clearly it was the first time i was realizing because at this moment, we were all in jail, all five of us, my mom, my dad, my older brother, my twin brother, Holy and myself. Shit. And I'm like, okay, so this is what happens to the Carnesis family. Like, we're all just going to be sitting in cages for the rest of eternity. And I was facing 10 years. And so I was, you know, it's when you're in a jail cell and you're facing 10 years, it the jail cell seems a lot smaller. It's a lot more depressing. Like, there was guys that would come in with DUIs that were doing like 10 days. And they'd be all chipper and talkative and wanting to get to know everybody. And it, it would make my blood boil. And this is how fights would break out because of these little happy-go-lucky people coming in when there's people that are facing real problems. Um, 
through that process, I got in trouble in jail. Uh, me and my twin brother, we court was delayed a week, so we switched wristbands and switched cells. He was like, check out my house and I'll check out yours. <laughs> Holy yeah, shit. I know. <laughs> and so, um, and we were co-defendants, so we were separated and we would only see each other at court. And so just real quickly, like whispering behind the cops, we're like s- switching wristbands. And um, we actually got away. With How do that. I know which brother I'm talking to right now? <laughs> yeah, now we got all the tattoos, but it was, um, it was really fun because we got away with it. But then I was trying to get my GED in jail and a kid, a guy from my classroom sort of inadvertently snitched on me because he was, he thought it was so cool. And he brought it up in front of the teacher and the teacher just obviously snitched. And so now, um, they put me in, and first I was in the hole for a week, which was a nightmare. Can imagine. But, and that was like my first time ever feeling suicidal. Um, it, it was, that's how bad the hole was, is it was the first time in my life I actually was like, oh my God, am I going to kill myself? Is this how it ends for me? And luckily it didn't. Um, I, I persevered, but they put me in a place called TSEP, which in the county jail is where all the death row inmates are. So I spent my last, I did about six months in death row and learned a lot from these guys. And, you know, one of my biggest mentors who really taught me how to understand myself and really come to terms with who I am. He was so brilliant in the way he spoke. He was so articulate. I didn't know who he was. I looked him up later. Um, he's dead now, obviously, because of death row. But uh, yeah, he, he took an ax and killed his entire family, he killed his kids, his wife and his in-laws and his grandparents, like everybody killed the whole household, like in some spit of rage, craziest dude in the world. But you wouldn't know it. Uh, how soft-spoken and gentle and wise he was, wise beyond his years. And so I had no idea who I was talking to until I got out and looked him up. But at the time, he was very pivotal for me. So That's um, wild. No, I know. It's crazy to think about. And um, This is some movie shit, by the way. <laughs> it's so funny. And so I, and I think about these people all the time, like, man, some of the most brilliant and like loving, like, and so going through this foster system and all these people and all this loneliness and hatred and, and people looking down on me, the only people showing me love were these death row inmates. Mm. But And my brother went through the same thing in his tier. He was on death row with a bunch of guys that were taking care of him too. Um, and so, you know, this was the moment when I was like, okay, I, I'm never coming back. I don't want to be a, a generational curse of prison and jail. I have to do better. This is the first time in my life I'm reading books. I was reading a book a day, which... Um, at the time for me, it was very impressive because I'm like this drug addict, junkie, drug dealing kind of like I wasn't reading books. I wasn't doing homework in school. Now I'm reading a book a day. So I'm finally sober, finally getting knowledge and finally understanding that the world is bigger than what I thought it was. And so I knew when I got out of jail, I had to figure out my life. And so I got out of jail, got my GED it's first thing I did was I enrolled in adult education and got my GED and then, um, applied to college, got denied immediately, went to the college campus and approached the, um, president of admissions and asked him to meet with me. He wouldn't meet with me. And long story short, it took like a whole week. I, he, I finally give him my whole pity story about how my life has been and what I've been through and I just need help and I need to get through college and I won't let you down. And he pushed a few buttons on the keyboard and was like, you start in the fall. And that's how I got into college was by just some amazing. And these are the angels in your life. Like he doesn't even know who I am. Probably doesn't remember my name. And I don't even remember his name, but he was an angel sent from heaven that like catapulted me into Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to get an education where I still sold cocaine the whole time. Cause I, you know, was still kind of transitioning, but so, I mean, that's sort of what the eye-opening moment was, was, was going to prison, finding these people that were helping me uh, see a bigger life, and then an angel appears and catapults me into the education system. I'm going to say this in hopefully a non what is not going to come off as nonchalant, and I, I teach this to my clients all the time, like the peace comes in the pause. Being in the hole is what you needed. Yeah. You know, and that's such a crazy thought, dude, Yeah, where you're like this, dude, this is what you need. This is what you need. You talked about you, you got the message, but you didn't read it. It's like, well, you got time now. Yeah. Yeah. Nothing but it. Right. (laughs) And that's why I think you see so often these, these people who have to go through the suffering of 
the isolation of prison and that loneliness, you often hear them say like, it's going to change their life forever. And I, I applaud that. And my peace and my pause came in a multitude of times. And generally it was because everyone walked away from me. There was no one left. I had done all the things I had taken advantage of all the people I'd cheated on all the girls. I mean, for my own little brother to tell me, never talk to me again. You're not my brother. That was a moment. Like that was, and I shared this with him recently, like that was for me, that nail in the coffin of like, dude, you got to take a look. Cause like even losing the million dollars, whatever, who gives a shit? losing a girlfriend, whatever, who cares? But losing my little brother, like that was, that was the thing. And it forced me into some really intensive, not only reconciliation, but acknowledgement where I had to, for the first time in my life at 26, like take inventory. Like you did this. And we live in a, a society in which people play the victim so incredibly well. And you have the right to, like, I don't take that away from people. Dudes like me and you, we deserve to whatever we want. We want to have a horrible life and we want to burn it down. No one can fault us for that. But Eric, the thing I always come to, it's like, man, if, if you can destroy your life, imagine what you could do if you put that same energy into your life. And that was the flip of the switch for me. It was like looking at it and going, you know what? You can have more. You don't deserve more. No one owes you understanding. In fact, no one even cares. Like that's how dark it is. If you really think about it, like you and I sharing this story, we go, oh man, that's so crazy. It's so great that you made it out and we'll walk away from here and we'll go back to our lives. But the truth is, and you know this as well as I do, those people who are willing to raise their standards on a daily basis will be set free. And you talked about reading. Uh, it's funny because I heard you mention a, a book that changed your life. I have it sitting next to me here. Uh, it's Eckhart Tolle's A New Earth. Um, let me tell you something insane about this book. If you look at this book, it looks seemingly brand new. I have a theory about this particular copy of this particular book. So when I was 20 years old, my, my roommate's girlfriend knocks on my bedroom door one night and she's like, Hey, can I talk to you for a second? And I'm like, stop. I'm like, yeah, whatever. What do you want? You know, I was on my own at that point. I was working a job, working at a fast food restaurant, being a manager, but man, I was going hard on the drugs and alcohol, hard on the girls, hard on the everything. Right. And she goes, Hey, I, I, I want to give you this book. And I'm like, okay. And she gives me a copy of this book. And Eric, I th the second she walks out of the room, I throw it in the trash can. How dare you? I'm going to give me a book. And fast forward, I'm deep on this healing journey. Been doing the work, speaking on stages. I already written my first book, so on and so forth. I go into a Goodwill and in the middle of Denver, like, I don't know, just a random Goodwill. Cause I was like, I'm just going to go to Goodwill. It's a weird thing that I do sometimes. And I walk in and on the bookshelf is this book brand new unbroken spine, having never been touched before. And I thought to myself, this is the book I threw in the trash. This is the copy of the book. Now, yep. logically you go, probably not, but realistically you go, well, that makes a lot of sense. This book changed your life. Sir. Tell me about that. So it's, it's funny. The universe is a magical place. So I'm going to have to say that probably is trash. Right. Like, I agree. <laughs> uh, there's no coincidences in this universe. Everything's, um, everything's sort of designed, but yeah, that book. Wow. So the first time. The first time, so I'm going through, I mean, everything I had ever gone through in my life, I thought money would solve. And so now I'm like making all this money. I bought this huge house and uh, got this fancy car and the women, I mean, every night just you bring a new girl over. Friends would bring girls over to show off their new girlfriend and she'd end up in my room. And, you know, it was like I was just living this chaos. Yeah. Which for me was amazing because. You know, I was so depressed in high school. Like I was the most popular kid in like five high schools because me and Anthony had, were the only ones with our own apartment. We had seniors from every high school in town coming by to like hang out with their girlfriends. And we had like this big house 
and uh, and then all the drugs that we were supplying, like we were super popular. I was so depressed and so insecure and like lost that I was single for almost all of high school. I couldn't, girls had huge crushes on me. I couldn't, um, I, I didn't have enough self, um, uh, sort of, I don't know what the term is that I'm looking for, but there was something preventing me from being able to accept the love of another. Mm. Right. And so all these people, and so I was very depressed, very dark, very lonely. I'm finally making money and I have all these things. I'm like, oh, this is the answer. And now I'm like letting all these girls in and I'm having fun and it's exciting. And I am waking up in the morning and I can't get out of bed. I'm so depressed and I'm like hiding because there's this window of time. And anybody who suffers from depression knows this window. There's this mm -hmm. twilight right as you're waking up in the morning before you're fully awake where there's like, even if it's only for 30 seconds where the anxiety has gone, the depression has gone. You're, you're like in this little twilight of happiness. And so I would lay in bed under the covers and try to hang on to that feeling because I would be afraid to face the day and afraid to get out because I was realizing that money wasn't solving anything. All it was doing was surrounding me with things that I didn't already have, but it wasn't filling my cup mm. in a way. And so I was still empty. I was still depressed. I was still homesick, um, still living in the past, all these things. And so I finally start panicking. It's like, I, I, because now I realize, oh, money's not the solution. So then what is it? And that's the first time I ever stepped outside of myself and looked back at me. And when I looked into myself for the very first time, it was an abyss. I mean, it was so deep and so dark and so gone. And just, I could see that everything I was searching for was somewhere in that darkness. And I had no idea what to do. And so I was having panic attacks. I was short, shortness of breath. Anxiety was so strong that I couldn't control it. I was having all these violent thoughts and just things were happening. And so I stumbled across this book and I was, I mean, I was literally in a panic. And so I find this book and I'm just like, I needed an answer and I needed something to get me out of what I was going through. And I'm in a total crisis mode. And so I was like, in order for this book to work, I need to just make everything in this book happen in my life one chapter at a time. And so there was like 30 chapters in the book. I took a whole month to read it. I'd read one chapter in the morning. And I would force that chapter into my life. And so the first chapter was like a meditation I did. The second chapter was something else that I'd made happen. Another chapter was about a tree and how we're just here to grow. And so I brought that into my life. I sat under a tree and thought about me as the tree. I just did what the book said. And it started putting words to things that I had felt. Like I got so much of my self-importance from my pain. And it's amazing how you can have pride for being a piece of but it's like, I took pride in my nothingness. I took pride in being ghetto. I took pride in my parents being in prison because that's all I had. And so I was like spiraling into this thing that this book calls the pain body and that we are extremely addicted to our pain body. And we want to feel that pain. We want to relive it. We want to hang on to it. That's why we have a good time. And as soon as the good time's over, we let it go. But if someone dies, Lord knows you'll cry for months about it because you're so addicted to your pain body. When really it's the opposite. When someone dies, you should cry for a day, let it go. And you should, when you have a good time, you should remember that joy and that freedom and that smile. And you should hang on to that for months at a time, right? So the book just put so many words to feelings that I didn't know. I never had a mentor, never had anybody to help me out with stuff like that. And so that book single-handedly changed my life. From the moment that I picked that book up and read the first chapter, the anxiety left my chest and it's never come back. I've never had anxiety since. Mm, it's amazing. Yeah. It's, I mean, that's so apropos to the idea of like when the student's ready, the master appears. Yep. And, but you gotta be willing, man. You know, it's, it's funny. Cause like on the table is also the first book and the second book that I've written and people will reach out to me and they'll be like, thank you. This changed my life. And I'm like, yeah, but you were ready, you know, and that, that holds true for me. Like when I read the alchemist for the first time which is a book I talk about with frequency, like it changed my life forever because it was the first time where I was like, wait a second, maybe there's more 
to this whole thing than I thought. Maybe this is all about this journey of learning. Maybe even through all the suffering and the hurt that there's something more here. And, and I see it take place in a lot of different ways. I see the lives change of my clients. I see the lives change of the people who see me on stage. My brothers, like it's unbelievable what my family has done with their lives. But most importantly, me, because dude, I can go look in the mirror right now and I'm like, good, I'm good. It doesn't mean I'm where I want to be. Let's be very clear about that. But what it means is I get to show up every single day living into the fullest version of who I am. And what's so difficult about that is like on paper, it sounds easy. In this podcast, it sounds like, oh, he read a book. He sat in front of a tree. His life is better. <laughs> what people don't understand is that we choose our suffering. Like we choose our suffering. Healing is still suffering right? Um, that might be a, an odd way to phrase it, but I look at that and I call it suffering because suffering means to be in discomfort. The drugs, the girls, the money, the clothes, the cars, the chaos. If that's your norm, peace is only achieved through suffering because you must step into the discomfort. Like you're, you're in the, the home studio right now and I hope there's abundance of peace that you feel being in here because I've created that. But dude, it took walking through hell to get here. And so I'm wondering, like, in the process that you've gone, looking at all that suffering, being where you are today, like, what, were, what was your chosen suffering? What was the path that you decided to walk down to be who you are today? That's a good question. I'll, you know, I'll say, just to clear up the Eckerd Tolley conversation, um, I read that book in 2005. That's when my journey started. And so it's been what, 19 years. Mm. And every day I'm still on this journey, still, still reaching, still learning, still growing, still battling demons. You know, it's, uh, it's by no means a simple fix, but after 19 years, looking back, I can see that that was the catapult and there was ups and downs the whole way. And there's still ups and downs, but, um, so to anybody who's going through something right now and, and, and wants to second guess or, or short circuit sort of our message, just understand that it's a journey and it has to start somewhere and where you start is perfect for you. And it's important though, that you start and that you yes. hang in there. And so I think my, um, my path of suffering, it helped me. It really just helped me to stay focused and work my way out in a way and and so that because we go through these you know i i transitioned then like a butterfly transitions you know from the worm or whatever and and so and i'm doing it again now and and so there's we do this multiple times to get me out of that whole chaotic unworthy victim mentality uh, lifestyle that I was living with the drugs and all that and the unhappiness and the depression to get out of that required uh, deep introspection and hard work. That's really what it was. And so I could, I'd wake up in the morning and I'd go straight to the office and I'd work 14 hours a day, just trying to make wealth and just trying to uh, focus on something, have phone calls. I've always been in sales. So, you know, I'll be in a cubicle. Making Ain't that it. the truth? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, true. And so I'm just like on the phone all day long, closing deals, doing as much as I can do. And, and just really trying to build a business and build an empire and build some wealth. And then I come home at night and I'm reading books and I'm taking my dogs for a walk and I'm finding peace and I'm finding quiet. And, and that's my whole life. And then somewhere in those hours, I will randomly like meet a girl and I'll let her into my life for either a few months or a few years, depending on the girl. Um, you know, all my relationships are very similar. They're either four months long or four years long. It's just this weird, um, maybe that's my lucky number, but, um, and so, you know, women come and go and they they help me a lot. And, um, I've been healed by every woman I've ever dated. I've loved dearly. And I've healed from them. They've given me something that I've taken that I have to this day. Some of them hate my guts. And those are the Heard ones that. who really love me. And then True. some of them still love me. And those are the ones who probably never love me. Right. And so it's, it's this weird um, concept, but there's, there's been a beautiful ebb and flow of women helping me with that divine feminine energy, helping me heal, 
hugging me when I needed it, rubbing my back, you know, just really taking me on this journey as I'm reading more and more books. And, and, and I've, I've said this before, and so I don't want to sound repetitive, but the book isn't the answer. Like I read Healing Anger from the Dalai Lama and I was still like pissed off all the time, <laughs> you know, it's, it, and so, and I've read, uh, like the power and now Eckhart Tolle's other book. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I still have moments where I'm living in the past or I'm living 10 years in the future. And I'm not even, I'm not really indulging in the power of now. So it's not like the book has, has everything you need. You also have to take time to, to manifest these realities into your life. And you also have to be graceful with yourself. Like I used to judge myself. If I made a mistake, I'm like, Oh my God, Eric, you're a piece of shit. You idiot. And like, how could, I can't believe I would talk to myself like that, Yeah, like to call myself an idiot. And so it's, um, and now, and so that's where the grace comes in. Now, when I make a mistake, I just breathe in. I'm like, Eric, you're everything that's perfect. You're what you need to be right now for this process. Let's keep going. And that's how we move on. And so that was the first step was the hard work, staying focused 14 hours a day, reading when I can and women helping me out. Then this next step is outreach. This is why I wrote my book. This is why I'm starting a podcast. This is why I'm here with you now is because, uh, and, and you've been a great example. I've been loving uh, listening to your podcast and seeing what you're doing. I'm glad that we found each other truly from the bottom of my heart, because what you're doing is exactly what I want to do. And so uh, you're leading by example and you're a, you're a pioneer here doing this. And I'm just going to try to come in behind you and, and make the wake bigger, you know, yeah. and that's my journey now is impact and outreach. How can we have more impact? The mm -hmm. money's there, the businesses are there. Now it's like, okay, there's a million foster homes out there that are not doing good right now. How can we help? Mm. So. The constant evolution. Yep. You know, I, I look at even what I'm building now and we're working on launching the Unbroken Men part of the company specifically for guys. Because you know, Eric, it, it just hit me so incredibly hard recently where I was like, I have been in the position of call it just because I'm a hustler, right? Um, you know, being born into what we were born in, we've had to guys like us have always had to find a way and I have found a way I've been on billboards in times square. I've been on television shows I've traveled the world and back again, passports full of stamps from dating lawyers and supermodels to the most incredible women in the world to sitting and having dinner with like you know, guys like Tom Bilyeu and David Meltzer and Anthony Trucks to being on stages with guys like Jordan Peterson. And like, it's all these crazy things that have happened over the course of my life because of the thing that I have in me that I'm so driven that I'm not going to let anyone stop me. And I was sitting and thinking about closing this company down last summer. I was exhausted, just completely unmotivated, eight years of grinding constant travel, 200 days a year on the road. And I, I took a pause and then went down to South America for four months. I uh, did an ayahuasca journey, connected with some friends, spent some time alone just with me. And it hit me so incredibly hard where I was like, oh, the evolution is to guide men, is to teach them how to heal, to teach them to be able to sit down and have a vulnerable conversation like this in front of another man. And and not feel shame and guilt and show them how to apply grace and have the health, wealth and relationships that they can have. And, and it's like, that is chosen suffering. You know how much easier it would be for me to just keep doing what I'm doing, right? It's, it's easy. I've been doing it for eight years. There's no challenge in it. I'm in this place right now where I have not felt this motivated in probably three years where I'm putting in the 14 hour days where I'm super focused on the business, where I'm doing whatever it takes to help these guys. And, and the most important part about it is it's just because it fills me up because like, I think about the damage I've caused to men over my life, the fights, the drugs, the theft, the pain, like, again, thinking about coming full circle, you don't think about the impact of the small business owner, the guy who owns the shop, who has a wife and three kids who can barely afford health insurance. And I go in there and I still the $400 VCR or whatever, right? If you don't know what a VCR is, Google it. All right. You know, but like, that's, that's what the thing is. You know, you rewind it, you look at that and I go, karma is real. Energy is real. There is something to be said about this idea 
of clearing that energy through your actions, your effort, and your intentions. And one of the things that I know that you're a very big proponent of is energy, is reciprocity, is pulling things into the universe, is stepping away from the negative self-talk. What role has all of that truly played in your life? That's been the most life-changing and the most healing part of my entire life has been focusing on the reciprocity and focusing on positive self-talk. And so, you know, in the beginning, it's, it's, um, it's a little bit more difficult in the beginning because you have this habit of not being positive all the time. And so, you know, I just started saying control alt delete on anything that was negative in my mind and I'd rephrase it. So if, if, uh, if I made a mistake in business and I'd be like, oh, I'm not up, I'd like control alt delete, you know, what an amazing learning experience this is. Let's move mm -hmm. on from here. The reframe. Yeah. And so it started by reframing a lot. Now, now I don't reframe much. There's a whole lot of positivity going on up here. <laughs> and I get that. I can, uh, and it, it, it turns you into a, cause you're a magnet for anything that you're radiating. So when you're moping around and you're feeling like you're radiating or you're magnetizing to you. And when you're being hateful, you're bringing hate to you which, and I can see it so clearly, like I have it all figured out now because I was big, big hate a long time ago. And I was always in fist fights and always had hatred around me, even arguing with girlfriends. And then there was a time when I was just like big business energy and I was getting contracts and people wanted to do business. And I'm like juggling all these opportunities. It's like, which is it going to be? And now I'm big reciprocity now it's like okay the the universe has given a lot to me it's time for me to give back and you know it's a you create a blockage also i was never good at receiving mm. and because i'm the guy that gives i'm the giver now right so that's how i identified is i'm the giver i'm paying for dinner for sure i'm paying for dinner and i'm doing whatever i got to do to be the one giving and i take care of everything and i would never want to receive well the way reciprocity works is you're blocking the flow of that energy and so you have to receive also, you can't just give, 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 and think that, oh, I'm going to give back to the universe and the universe is going to give to me. If you're not receiving, then you're telling the universe not to give you anything. So learning to receive was big for me. Uh, learning to give was big for me. And then putting them together has been such a huge transition for me and a big step for me in the right direction of just the sun shines brighter now. And mm. my life is just so much more peaceful now. And things go the way I want them to go now, always. And uh, and everything that um, that maybe doesn't is just something that I was supposed to learn. Yeah. I ask myself on a daily basis, who can help me and who can I help? Yes. Because that is reciprocity. Because I can assure you, when I was the I got it all figured out guy, my life was a disaster. When I was the I know what to do guy, my life was a disaster. I'm the first one to pick up the phone and call for help. Literally, and I'll give you a great example of this. I go out, I'm, I'm in the dating space right now, trying to figure out that phase of my life. I've done well in my health and my wealth. And so now relationship becomes a priority. And I was getting ready to go on this date. It was a last second thing on a Friday night in Las Vegas. There's no reservations. And so what did I do? I picked up the phone. I called a friend who's a general manager of a very nice restaurant in town. I said, hey, I need some help. Do you think you can make this happen for me? And wouldn't you know it? The answer was yes. And I was able to get a reservation in this very hard place to get a reservation for on a Friday night. And, and what I'm thinking about, and the reason why I bring this up is because it's not just that it's in business, texting back and forth with my best friend yesterday, amazing entrepreneur sitting down with you. I need amazing guests to sit on this show. You need an amazing show to be on and share this story. We as these spiritual energetic beings, we attract who we are. And if you are a person who asks for help, you will attract people who are willing to help you and who you can help. The problem is we grow up and we believe that our value comes in serving others always, forever, and constantly and putting ourselves on the back burner. Well, that learns, that leads to burnout. That leads to crash and burns. That leads to unfulfilling relationships. That leads to not having the wealth that's truly wealth and not just money, which you know is a very big difference. What has been the hardest thing that you've learned about asking for help? 
Um, so first that's very, that was very well said. Um, that was a great explanation of reciprocity. Thanks for putting that out into the universe. Um, the biggest challenge for me for asking for help was, uh, it was having to dig myself out of my own hole my whole life. So being on my own in middle school and high school and college and just this whole journey of if I want it, I have to get it. And so I'm the one getting it. I started my own business. I'm making my own wealth. I'm buying my own homes. Like everything, I don't get paychecks. I'm not getting W-2. Like every single thing in my life I've ever gotten, I've gotten on my own. And I've earned it and I've built it and I've grinded for it and I've cried for it and I've done it all. And so you have this lone soldier mentality and when you're the one who's doing all the providing, how, how can you ask anybody for anything? And, and like my first lesson in this was when I, when I finally was trying to take my business to the next level, we had, we had hit a glass ceiling and there was just like, we're sort of like growing and losing at the same time. And we weren't going anywhere for like four or five months. And I just needed a mentor. And I was like too afraid to ask for one. And there Mm. was this guy that, I did his, uh, I own a financial company doing credit card processing. And so I did the credit card processing for the local Lamborghini dealership. And I would go talk to this guy because he was super relatable and super easy to talk to. And he was always at the dealership, but he never worked because he owned the place and he had Mm -hmm. sales. Like he was just there There, because he liked being around nice cars or something. Don't blame him. Yeah, he's retired (laughs) now. But And so I would just be like, I'd be driving around so frustrated and so confused and, and just needing help, but I couldn't ask anybody and I didn't have the courage or the grit to just pick up the phone and say, can you please help me with this problem? Because I'm the one that's in charge and how can I possibly not know the answer? And so, but I would know that he was there at the shop. And so I'd cruise by super frustrated and I'd show up and I'd sit down on the couch with a cup of coffee and I would just like beat around the bush question, you know, like I never, w- I never was like, will you be my mentor? Will you help me? Or, Hey, I have a problem with business as I would just like shoot the shit with them and like sneak my confusion in there. Yeah. And he would drop the most brilliant bombs on me. And, you know, this was for, for several years. I would, whenever I had a funk, I'd sneak up on this guy, very wealthy Jewish guy from, from a, a good family raised right and built a great business. And, um, so he just knew all the answers so easily and eloquently. And so I would just like pick his brain and I'd go and I, every, whatever I learned from him, I'd strategize. And that's, it sort of started that way. You know, finally I got the courage to tell him, um, like, Hey, you were pivotal in my success. And, um, I'd never had someone that I could talk to and I never had anybody to come to and whether you knew it or not, you were my mentor. And I appreciate you for that. And like, you know, I finally told him that I think like a year ago, So, um, so that's how hard it was for me to get into that. Now, um, very simple. I have a mentor right now and I'm that I can, I'll ask anything anytime. And, uh, and I'm not afraid to ask in, in any aspect of my life and family issues, relationship issues or business issues. I have, um, an an openness to ask and a willingness to receive, Mm -hmm. I have to say, and I, it doesn't make me less of a man because I'm not standing on my own two feet. Like we're all here together, even the trees in the forest, they're standing by themselves above ground, but underneath the ground, they're all holding hands and locked in together. Right. And so that's sort of how we are as a human species is we are, we're sitting in these two chairs right now, but we're still together, energetically linked up, leaning on each other and growing together. And so understanding that was huge for me Mm. and, and thank God I figured it out. It only took me 40 years, but yeah, (laughs) I get it. (laughs) Yeah. One of the things, obviously, that you're doing with that same energy and reciprocation is in your efforts and your energy to have this really open, difficult conversation about not only foster care, but growing up in that system, the energy you're putting forth to change it, but also this new book. And so I'd love for you to tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, the book, um, the book had to be written. And what's it called? It's called Golden Scissors. And, um, so it's a three part series. It's the series is called tales of resilience. It's book one, book two, and book three. So book one is launching in March. Book one is golden scissors. And this was 
the most painful hook I've ever had to write. It was, I cried on every page. My keyboard is rusty from it. And like, it was a very, like you think you're healed and then you start reliving these moments and you you find these little triggers, you know, it's, um, even just recently, I was, my book editor called me and she was like, I'm confused about this one thing here. And can you talk to me about that? And like, I broke down in tears and I was like, oh my God, you found a trigger. Like, I didn't even know that was there. Mm. Like, thank you for bringing that up. Totally just unexpectedly. I still had some unresolved emotions about a certain issue around my grandma. Right. So we got around that. But so this book is the first, it's the first nine months I was homeless or maybe more like a year and a half. It's from the time that my house got raided by the DEA until Anthony and I uh, started trying to hitchhike to California. And so there's this time where we were in all these crazy foster homes and then we were homeless on the streets and we were dealing with the emotions for the first time. And it sort of goes through a day in the life of these homeless middle schoolers and what they went through emotionally. And it, it really is a story that there's learning in that story but it's not a self-help book right it's just a story that you can learn from by reading it and then book two is another story uh, about what it was like to be in high school and in jail and then book three sort of becomes the self-help because book three is more my journey of when i finally looked into the abyss and what that experience was like and the things i did to get out of it but the whole thing together is going to be a very powerful volume um, but this, this first book is the one, I mean, the most painful of it all. Like this is when I was young, I was confused. I was scared. I was crying. I was adjusting to the streets and, you know, we were in gunfights. We were doing drugs. We were drunk on alcohol, stealing. I mean, there was so much going on, stolen cars. You'll probably read it and just laugh at all your own memories. Yeah. Like, you know, you might, oh, me too, brother. You know what I mean? But it's, but there's a lot of people out there that don't have, um, don't have a view into this world. And most importantly, I wanted to highlight what the foster system was like and, and really holding that system accountable for what it really is, because it really is garbage. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the social workers were just nine to five, you know, if you needed them before 9am or after 5pm, they weren't there for you. And they, and when they would come by to check on the house, you had to go to your room and they would only talk to the foster parents. They never asked you for your own feedback, what you were going through. And so, you know, the, it really highlights the problem with the foster system. And then it highlights how to deal with emotions and how to deal with depression and how to overcome it. Because even at a young age, and even before we really came out of it, you can see us growing through this process. And you can see us becoming more independent and more self-sustaining. You can see us crying less, managing our emotions better, becoming more independent, understanding that we're just, these are the cards we were dealt. Let's deal with them. Let's not pity ourselves to death. And so there is tremendous growth in this first volume. And then it goes on to the next two volumes, but it's, um, it's a beautiful story. I don't think anybody who reads it is going to dislike it think it's a page turner but you know obviously you're asking the guy that wrote it well if so. you don't believe in yourself who will <laughs> yeah, exactly so i i feel like anybody who picks up that book is not going to be able to put it down until the very last page i hope so and um and i'm going to send you a copy it, it's um i'll be getting some prints in the next few weeks and then like i said it launches march 15th i'm looking forward to it man and congratulations as someone who's written multiple books um two of them on the table one of them that has not yet seen the light of day in the other room um, I know the, the amount of energy, um, the amount of tears, the amount of frustration, the amount of redoing and all the effort that it takes to actually to do that. So first, congratulations. Um, that's probably the most resilient act any man can do is sit down and write a book. Yeah. <laughs> um, and of course, guys go to think on look up Eric's episode where we'll have the link for that and more in the show notes before I ask you my last question, my friend. Uh, where can everyone find you? Uh, honestly, find me on Instagram. It's Eric underscore Carnesis. And, uh, you know, it's it's as good as an email or a text message. I don't post a lot on there. I'll be posting more as I start this book launch journey and I start this podcast journey. But, you know, those are messages I check. I use social media actually to be social. 
you know, so the messages I check, I, I email back and forth with people. That's how I stay in touch with old friends. It's just a, a place I go to connect. So find me on there uh, for anything that you might want to talk about or need from me. And then, uh, but that's really it. I have a website, you know, Eric Carnesis and uh, stuff like that. But really social media is probably the easiest place. Amazing. And again, guys, thinkunbrokenpodcast.com to grab that link. First, before I ask you my last question, just want to extend to you gratitude, uh, love, support, and let you know that as someone else who has went from homeless to hero, uh, I see your energy and I thank you for being here. My hope is that people who are listening to this can recognize that they didn't have to have a background like us to have and become the hero of their story, that it all lies in a decision and a choice to be that person. My last question for you, my friend. What does it mean to you to be unbroken? What does it mean to me to be unbroken? Uh, that's a beautiful question. I, I think it's important to understand that, that life breaks you, right? So to be unbroken is not to be invincible. I think to be unbroken is to heal and to overcome things that are hurting you. And so that's taking life with grace. It's taking judgment out. I think the most important thing of an unbroken person is forgiveness. There's so much people who have hurt us and so much pain that we've endured and given to ourselves that forgiving those people, forgiving ourselves, and just forgiving the world for being an imperfect place is mm -hmm. a really huge step into being an unbroken person. And so when you tell me you're unbroken, it means that you handle your obstacles with grace. It means that you forgive every part of your life. And it reminds me of a quote because you had mentioned um, suffering earlier. And, it, and obviously, the first thing I think of is DMX. And, uh, and so this DMX quote has been in my mind for the last half hour. And then you are asking about being unbroken. And he says in a, in a really sad song that I don't listen to that much because I believe in manifestation and I don't want to hear too much negativity in my life, mm -hmm. but I will say, he says in the beginning of the song that to live is to suffer and to survive is to find meaning in the suffering. Mm -hmm. And I've always thought that was a beautiful phrase. And, um, okay, he was, a uh, a very powerful figure, a broken man, unfortunately, with drugs and stuff, but a powerful figure. And I think that that also has to do with an unbroken person is finding meaning in your suffering. Mm -hmm. Brilliantly said, my friend, thank you so much for being here. Unbroken Nation, thank you for listening and watching. Please remember to share this episode because when you do, you're helping other transform their trauma into triumph, breakdowns to breakthroughs, and to become the hero of their own story. And until next time, my friends be unbroken. I'll see you. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review, and you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends, and until next time, be unbroken.